to February Reads. I'm so excited not only to be bringing you a book that I liked, but it's a book that I read before and liked and still like. There's nothing more discouraging than realizing you had crappy taste. <laughs> Today's book is Tell Me Three Things by Julie Buxbaum. I have reviewed some other novels of hers and I think I'm like a 50-50 split at this moment. I believe I have one or two other books that I need to read and review, but it all started because of Tell Me Three Things. I decided to read it because I'm always looking for books about grief. And then on top of that, it is a book about a girl being a new girl. And as an army brat, I totally relate to that. In this novel, Jessie's mother has died of cancer. It's been about two, almost three years. And her father, whirlwind romance. She didn't even know he was in a romance, but he met another woman named Rachel in a grief support group. He said he was going to a conference because he's a pharmacist. He said he was going to Florida for a conference or a convention and he actually came back married. So he lied to her and he got married and now he's moving her from their hometown of Chicago to LA. So not only she's still dealing with the grief of losing her mother, but also having to adjust to basically a culture shock. I thought it was sort of like a light fluffy material, but not light and fluffy. I thought it had a good balance of serious and lightheartedness. And a lot of that is owed to the fact that she is in the land of the fake, if you will. I mean, LA is a different kind of world from what I hear. Nobody is who they seems. Everybody is relatively superficial. This is what she's facing. She does have a new stepbrother named Theo who is also in her grade. However, he wants nothing to do with her. In some respects, this book had a lot of cliches and stereotypes. I did like that eventually she was able to connect with him. And what made it better was because they would have a moment and then he'd be like, well, you know I'm still gonna ignore you at school. So I was like, all right, at least he's owning up to it. You know, at least he's not just pretending. He, he, he acknowledges what he's doing. He's moved to LA and nobody will talk to her. She is a pariah. When we open, she is two weeks in at this new prep school, this new really highfalutin high school called Wood Valley. And even though Rachel is super wealthy and Theo is super wealthy, she does not consider herself super wealthy. Uh, Theo won't even drive her to school, so she's driving her like beat up Toyota or whatever it is, and she's surrounded by all these high end luxury cars. And you know, she doesn't have the clothes, she doesn't have the same look. And I liked how she is essentially a normal girl. She, there's nothing wrong with her, and she, and she'll acknowledge this, but in context of where she is, where everybody is fit, they're thin, they're tan, they're blonde, they're perfect. She's starting to have insecurities that she's never had before. Thankfully, she has her best friend Scarlett from back in Chicago and Scarlett is there to, you know, keep her sane. Throughout this novel, we see how Scarlett tends to come through for her and say the things that need to be said and uplift her when she needs to be uplifted. However, we also get the side plot with Scarlett now dating this guy who it wasn't really a romantic interest for Jesse, but like they had kissed. And so now it's kind of this little running joke for them, but now it's getting serious for Scarlett. Anyways, we jump into, and I'm, I'm a little hazy on the details here. Jesse had been reached out to via email by this guy or this person identifying themselves as somebody nobody. This is somebody that has noticed her at school and has reached out to help the adjustment process go better. They don't want to reveal their identity, but they do walk her through kind of the ins and the outs. I, we, we then jump into her first day of school and how she ends up going to the wrong place and embarrasses herself. I'm not clear, and this is, all me, this has nothing to do with her writing. It just was me not paying attention, which that's not new. I was unclear when somebody, nobody initially reached out to her, 
and then how they even got her email because it wasn't her school email so somehow this person got her personal email and then they do start i again i i think this book was like 2013 2015 so i guess we had apps like a snapchat kind of deal where you could i am each other but every time she talked about instant messaging me as a millennial would go back to aim and i aiming and how when aim was huge we did not have cell phones <laughs> so you you could talk in the, the chat room or you guys could have your buddy lists and like you could have private chats you could not move these conversations outside of your computer not that i was confused or like flabbergasted over the fact that she could but it it did not compute because when you say instant message to me it is it's aim <laughs> Really, the novel starts with her two weeks into her time at Wood Valley, but then it jumps back to her first day at Wood Valley. So I don't really know when her first communication with somebody nobody is. As every new kid must, she does have a tormentor and this girl's name is Jim. We don't really get a good description of Jessie. We know she has these insecurities. We have a general knowledge as to her, her skin, her hair, her body type, but she had her insecurities are so deep and she is ostracized so much and she's picked on so much by Jem that I don't know if she's supposed to be pretty. There are moments later on where her attractiveness is commented on. But again, who knows? That could be her friends to try to make her feel better. We, so I, I wish I'd been a little clearer on like the picture that should be in my head because I know we're not supposed to judge the outside. We're supposed to go by the inside in terms of you know beauty. But when there's a romance involved, you kind of want to have a picture of an attractive person in your head, at least until they become attractive to you via their personality. I don't know. It's again, I said there's some stereotypes, these are there's some cliches, but there's this other person that we're introduced to, and his name is well, his name is Ethan, but she refers to him as Batman because apparently he dresses in the same Batman t-shirt and black pants every single day, so this is why she references him. She has nobody to eat with at lunch, and so her first inclination is they have a coffee cart filled with K's coffee with a K, cart with a K. And there are two chairs by this coffee cart. And her first inclination is to go use one of those chairs. But for some reason, no matter how early she gets there, they're always taken. And one of them is always taken by Batman. And he always has this entourage of people around him, also including Jem and her friend, but he doesn't seem to care about any of them. So this was a question that I had was why? We get character development later on that can tell me that maybe he had been a different person and so that is what people were still clinging on to or the fact that he is part of the local music group, the local rock band that everybody loves and so, you know, he'll just have a fan base due to that. She, he becomes her love interest so she finds herself attracted to him but uh, a lot of the times you're like, mm, like how tired looking is he? Because how attractive is it to see somebody with bags under their eyes and who just looks eternally tired, you know? She's stumbling through life, being kept afloat by Scarlet. One issue I did have was that apparently, so her dad, as I said, he goes away. He lies to her about where he's going. He gets married, he comes back, and he says, we're moving. I had some deep issues regarding the parenting in this novel. It goes back to there's a moment where she and Theo have begun bonding. He asks her, do you ever wish that it had been your other parent? Because for her, her stronger bond was, this, was with her mother. For him, his stronger bond had been with his father. This gives you the sense that even though she had a good relationship with her dad, we get nothing from him. And it's like he has absolutely abandoned her. I know this could be all about an unreliable narrator and just getting their viewpoint, but if he legitimately hasn't said more than a couple sentences to her in a couple weeks, 
that can't just be an unreliable narrator. And he does acknowledge that he wasn't there for her, that he didn't give her the attention that he she needed. He didn't check in on her. This is an instance of a guy with his head stuck up his butt. I just don't understand how he, he could have gotten into that state. Somebody nobody says, here's a tip for you. This girl named uh, Dri, she'd be a really good friend for you. So she's super shy, so you might have to make the first move. Jesse comments on Dri's glasses and then Dri starts to include her. Also Dri's best friend Agnes, who Jesse tends to equate to her best friend Scarlett, although she's like, I don't feel like Agnes is all that supportive of Dri, and so I don't really know why they're friends. This is not how I would be treating Dri. She finally has a friend or two, and then she gets partnered with Ethan for an English project. <sighs> it's on Ezra Pound's The Wasteland. I don't actually know what this project is about, which is probably more on me than on the writing. It seems like they're supposed to dissect this poem or this book and write a paper on it. In any case, it's one of those instances where you choose your own partner and nobody is gonna choose her and then all of a sudden someone taps her from behind and it's Ethan. She's all relieved only for him to come up to her after class and say, look, we don't need to work on this. I will do all the work and then I'll put your name on it and we will get an A. Now she's pretty let down because she has this fascination with him. She agonizes over this. She brings it back to the fact that they have an honor code again. And this is more on me than on the writing. I don't think she actually cared about the honor code. I think it was really more just a reason for her to go to Ethan and say, look, there's an honor code. I can't let you do that. Like I will not be part of cheating. I will get another partner if that's what we need to do. And he says, fine, you know, we'll, we'll just work together. I'm like no problem. So they start to bond that way and she learns that he is part of that local band. It's called Orgasmville, but everybody calls them Oville and I honestly, Orgasmville? I wished that Bucks Bomb had come up with a better name, but that's just personally. But it doesn't roll off the tongue. I don't feel like it really gels with a bunch of high school boys, but apparently they're really good, but nobody even wants to say Orgasmville, so they just call it all Oville. And there's also like a checkered past deal with Oville, like something went down before she moved to the area. Uh, also around this time, the dad reveals that he has gotten a job. Why he got a job? I don't really know because Rachel is involved with like film and so she is loaded. And then this connects back to not only is Jesse ostracized at school, but she doesn't feel at home in this house. She's staying in the guest room. She feels like everything is a look but don't touch. Like she just doesn't belong here. So they're having this family dinner. The Rachel is super excited about this announcement, but Theo throws a little hissy fit because it's embarrassing. Not only is uh, Bill, the dad, uh, a pharmacist, which is how dare you do something so lowly as a profession, but he's the pharmacist at the uh, convenience store right down the road. And so now everybody's going to see him and everybody's going to know he's related to Theo. I have two thoughts on this. One is as much as I was frustrated with Theo uh, because again, it was very stereotypical and I needed more development from him. It was characterization. Like, He's a very superficial guy. There is no disputing that. However, there's a moment where Rachel says some not so kind things about Jesse, but she won't recognize the fact that her son is a spoiled rich kid. Those are minor things. It took me a minute to get to this point of, it was actually a really good characterization for him a moment for him to show the differences between himself and Jesse, to display what kind of people are living in this area and what the culture she's now immersed in is. She though gets a job too. 
because even though Rachel has all this money, she feels like a guest in her own home and she doesn't feel comfortable asking Rachel for money. She won't even eat the food that their housekeeper serves. I'm just gonna live off peanut butter and jelly and like Pop-Tarts. So she goes to all these places uh, Starbucks was one and the guy says oh you know we can't hire you because you don't have Starbucks experience and she realizes that he is an actor and he's memorizing his lines and I think he says something about he had never done this before she's like so then how did you who had no Starbucks experience get this job and he goes I lied doing some more world building here but that seems to be the case in all the places that she applies to nobody will give her a job she's at her wits end when she sees this local hole in the wall sort of bookstore called book out below <laughs> which she thinks is really cheesy but she is able to convince the woman so this woman is the only person she's ever met in LA who looks like she should look who has not had any work done but this woman's like, I don't need help. My son is here and I just don't make enough money that I need more help. And so I was a little confused because it turns out that her son, she refers to him as William, but he is locally known as Liam and he is like one of the hot guys. And he had been in the class when she initially made a fool of herself. The mom's like, well, you know, my son, he has been wanting more time to devote to his band. So let me just talk to him. And then they kind of work there in tandem, but all that to say, how is she sending him to this highfalutin school if she's not wealthy? It didn't really add up to me, but just a plot device, make things a little bit more difficult for her, add some suspense. She is able to work there and she and Liam kind of forged this bond. And I, I enjoyed Liam because at first he seems really superficial himself. But then when they're working together, he seems like a, a pretty decent guy. Although I didn't understand why he warmed up to her so quickly, considering the way that she perceived him in that first class and the way that everybody else treats her. So I was like, is this going to be one of those deals where they're different at home and at school? I don't know. Maybe it was really more of a case that he didn't really have a chance to interact with her before she got kicked out of the wrong homeroom. We learned that he is in Oville and that he is, um, he's a relatively recent addition and that Oville had had some kind of scandal. And it turns out that Oville had a, a lead singer who had died and then Liam joined. But Liam, wouldn't you know it, he is in a relationship with Jim, which this is one of those cliches that I have a really hard time getting through where the boyfriend or the girlfriend is this really down to earth, great person and their significant other is the most superficial person you'll ever meet. I know both of these people are extremely attractive, but I, it was never explained what Liam saw in Jem, except for the fact that Jem was a different person when she was around Liam. But given that like, there's another incident later in this novel in which she treats Jesse in a very unkind way, I'm like, so obviously she does things when he's not around and he doesn't hear about them. I, I thought that like, I didn't mind them being together because again, it, 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 it creates an issue that we have to work past but I needed more it just it was very surface level and I mean I get it this is a young adult novel and it's almost 10 years old by this point so things have changed a little bit when it comes to writing and in fleshing out characters on top of that Jury is in love with Liam. She thinks he is the best thing since sliced bread. Liam, at some point, invites Jesse to watch his band play. Turns out his band is playing at Jem's house. And Jesse's like, I'm not going. I am not going because that is my tormentor. And this is the point where Jury is like, she's a completely different person when Liam's there. Like, we have to go. They do. 
and she gets pretty drunk. But before she gets drunk, Liam approaches her. And he's like, I'm so glad you're here. And he's like really touchy-feely. I thought it was kind of strange, except that I think he had been drinking as well by this point. But so he's talking to her and he's kind of handsy with her. And then Gem appears. And so you know this is going to cause some issues. Not only does she not like Jesse, but she doesn't want her boyfriend touching Jesse. She tries to draw his attention away. And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm talking. That's just the icing on the cake for her. Liam goes to, to perform and she threatens Jesse. She's like, you stay away from my boyfriend, you dirty little no-gooder. So this is the place where Jesse meets this guy named Caleb. Caleb is one of the other hot guys that had been in that senior homeroom. Uh, and he's like across the way on his phone and she's like, huh, like maybe he could be somebody nobody because by this point they've struck up a, this friendship, they're chatting all the time and she's getting, she wants to know who this person is. She's pretty sure it's a guy. She's texting with SN and she jokingly suggests that he come by her work. So what do you think happens? The next day, Caleb shows up at Book Out Below. She's like, oh my gosh, it's totally Caleb. But for me, there's all these red flags because Caleb's hot. But whenever she has an interaction with Caleb or even when she has an interaction with Liam, she acknowledges it's not the same as her I am conversations. I get it. You're trying to convince yourself of something but there are all of these flags that say this can't possibly be the same person because you don't have the same chemistry. You have chemistry with Liam, but it's not the same chemistry as SN. You even acknowledge this, how you like, you kind of would like to like Liam and you'd be okay if Liam were SN, but you don't really want it to be Liam and same with Caleb. Somehow she strikes up the courage to invite Caleb to coffee. He's like, Sure. Also around this time, she gets into a huge fight with her dad because she's always been a passive person, but she's hit her boiling point and she calls him out for his bad parenting and she's just not having it. He tries to defend himself, but she's like too little too late. Like you were not there when I needed you. She and Theo have also overheard a massive blow up between their parents at which point Theo says, do you think they're gonna get a divorce? And here is when Jessie has this turning point because she doesn't feel like she fits in LA, though she has made inroads, but she doesn't belong in Chicago either. She has jokingly talked to Scarlett about moving into her basement, but she comes to this realization that if, she and her dad are no longer allowed in this house. Like she has nowhere to go. They have nowhere to go. But on top of physically having nowhere to be and having to start over again, she doesn't actually know where she belongs anymore. So I liked how we sort of went from superficial to really digging in deep because now, I mean, we've, we've been talking about the loss of her mother, but now we're connecting it to her and to her roots and to her evolution. Uh, as I said, Theo, she's had all these little moments with him and they're beginning to connect, but and she just knows he's just one of those people that they, they aren't going to be school friends, but at least he's not as terrible as she thought he was going to be. Around the same time, Rachel also presents Jesse with a plane ticket back to Chicago because Scarlett's parents had been in touch talking about you know, if Jesse might need a place to stay for the rest of the school year and they realize how much she must miss home. And of course she and her dad are fighting. So Rachel delivers this. So now Jesse's all excited about coming home to Chicago and spending the weekend with Scarlett and you know, being back home. However, you know, she'd been at that party and uh, Jem is worse to her than ever. Ever. She makes some really unpleasant comments, unfounded comments in class where everybody can hear her. And I'm sitting here thinking, uh, bullying anybody? Like, why is nobody, why is the teacher not doing anything about it? 
And then to add insult to injury, Jesse's like head down. I'm not paying attention to this. I just need to get to my desk. Jem trips her. Jem like hits the desk hard or she, like she falls real hard. Nobody's doing anything. Nobody's coming to help her. Well, actually Ethan does. Ethan helps her up and gets her into her chair. But I was just like, this is harassment, out and out harassment. And everybody knows because even though nobody helps her, the only people snickering and making fun of her are Jem and Jem's friend. This teacher, why is this teacher not stepping in? Oh, I don't know guys. Her teacher, Mrs. Pollock, does pull her aside at the end of the class and she very inexpertly tries to approach doing something about the situation to which Jesse vehemently says, no, I'm not gonna make the situation worse. And Pollock is like, okay, I guess that's that. I was dissatisfied with that because Jesse, I like her. I've been invested in her. She's got spunk, yet she's just gonna take her lumps lying down. I wanted her to, to stand up to Jem. I wanted her to get back at Jem. I wanted her to do something that said she wasn't just gonna take it. The next thing we know, it is giving day. They are partnering with Habitat for Humanity and they're building houses. Here is when Jem reapproaches Jesse and she's threatening her again. Theo, finally, public declaration. He steps in for Jesse and he threatens Jem back. And he says, you do not mess with Jesse. I will come for you if you do. At which point Liam shows up and he's like, what's going on? Theo says, you need to talk to your girlfriend about that or you need to talk to Jesse. She, he, he said, you need to talk to one of these girls. I don't really remember. Liam turns to Jesse and Jesse's like, oh, it's nothing. And again, I'm like, oh my gosh, I know we're taking the higher road here, but like I need vengeance. <laughs> so we leave with Liam confronting Jem about whatever this situation may be. Lunchtime rolls around and Jessie is so hungry until she learns that this lunch is catered by Jem's dad. And now she's like, do I even want to be part of this? Ethan steps in and is like, you're gonna wanna eat. And they spend lunch together and you know, have this fun little time. We have been informed that Jem's dad has been charged with some kind of fraud, some kind of financial crime. This is why Jeb can't get in trouble at school is because her dad like owns the school. He has donated so much and her principal is just not going to do anything against Jem because the dad is so influential. But I'm like, but if he's under investigation, why do people still care? Why does she feel like she still has a security net? And then where is this money that he's coming up with? Because in my understanding, like his assets and everything would be frozen until this case has some kind of conclusion. And that shows how much I know about money and like money laundering and fraud and all those things. But the next thing we know, uh, she's on her way to Chicago, but not before Caleb has canceled their coffee date. And she is so mad because she believes he is SN. She's ambiguously referred to their coffee date to which his response could mean like he really has no clue or he's just plain clueless. So she goes off to Chicago without really revealing the betrayal and, and, and anger she feels. She gets to Chicago and Scarlett is isolating her. She is not making her feel welcome. She is making her feel like she never should have come in the first place. Scarlett has since befriended this girl who neither of them ever liked. Now, no, they've formed this little couple that is just gonna whisper about Jesse from across the room. Scarlett then disappears with her boyfriend into the laundry room uh, where Jesse believes they are having fun and games. Then the other girl starts making out with someone and she's just the third wheel. It's the expectation is that she will then hook up with this other girl's brother. And she's like, you get away from me. She gets very drunk. She texts SN and calls him out about breaking their date. He's like, I do not know what you're talking about. Like, in all seriously, I have no clue what you're talking about. I'm worried about you. 
the next morning she wakes up to find Scarlet there and they hash it out and she's like I don't understand why you're treating me this way and Scarlet calls her out and he's like well when you moved it didn't only affect you you were my best friend we were each other's best friend and when you left I had nobody so now I had to start over with people I had rejected you weren't there for me it was like everything was me being there for you and you never once asked about me she also reveals that she and her boyfriend have yet to sleep together and this is like an underlying theme just that coming of age kind of stuff but they patch things up and they have the best time together and then uh, Jesse gets a text message well, it's Agnes and Dre. they're in a three-way chat one thing that SN had revealed to Jesse was that his sister his older sister had died and so now Jesse had put feelers out. She wants to know who this person is. Neither Dre, Dre nor Agnes know of anybody who had, had who'd lost an older sister. But they're like, you know, Caleb, he does have an older sister, and we don't actually know what happened to her. She gets this text message, and they're like, saw them together at the supermarket. She's not dead. So now Caleb is out of the running for being SN. It's this whole big thing now because now they're all like, oh my gosh, who is SN? And Anywho, she comes back. There's also the knowledge that Liam and Jem have broken up, but that Liam wants to get together with Jesse. And now Jesse is conflicted because she likes Liam, but she likes SN more. And she doesn't actually believe that Liam is SN. And of course, Dree is this whole time, she's so worried, even though Jesse has told her she doesn't like Liam, even though she then says, I like Ethan. Dree is so worried, which I totally get. All of us who've ever had a crush, we are so worried that this crush will choose somebody else over us. And she gives Jesse her blessing. She's like, you know, if he asks you out and if you learn that he is SN, go for it because I get it. Liam does sort of approach Jesse, but she brushes it off. She like, she doesn't really go there. Now we're getting into the big spoilers. Cause she's picked up by Theo from the airport. At which point Theo reveals that, cause we all know there was something going on with Ethan's brother. And these are things that I got Bucks Bomb could have done better. Cause it was so, obvious that Ethan is SN. The comments that were made, I can't believe Jesse was obtuse enough not to put the pieces together. That Theo's older brother had issues and that Theo's older brother had overdosed and had died. He was no longer with them. She never once sat back and was like, what's up with Ethan's brother? Please explain to me what, what happened with, with him and, and the band and all that. Like, the answers were there. The opening to the questions were there and she just never stepped over that line. And it was, it was frustrating for me because, because of its obviousness. I, I don't mind misdirect, but Bucks Bomb could have hit it better. It could have been a bigger surprise and, and it wasn't. But Theo finally puts that key in the lock, opens the door and the light from heaven shines on Jesse and she's able to see the forest through the trees. So she's pretty 100% sure that Ethan is SN. She has really been putting the pressure on SN to reveal himself to her. And SN is like, okay, fine. Let's meet at the Waffle House at this date and this time. She walks in only to find Liam sitting there and she's like, Oh, okay, well, I guess it was Liam. And then she turns around and she sees Ethan. And then she turns around and there's Caleb. Well, what turns out is that they had a band meeting and run a little long and she just happened to run into Liam first, but Ethan is like, I'm SN. I don't know, there is a lot of things that teenagers will love about the the missed opportunities and the he said and the she said and the will they or they won't me won't they but i um i did i enjoyed this book i enjoyed the coming of age i enjoyed jesse's humor but i thought there were little 
little details that could have been a little bit tighter, but overall, I will slot this into my February lineup. Uh, I still don't understand why Jem fawned all over Ethan when she was dating Liam. I also don't understand why he had this group of admirers all the time, except that perhaps the loss of his brother had such a huge impact on himself and his family. And so perhaps he had been a different kind of person before his brother's death. And these people that he had grown up with still remembered that person, or even because of his brother's death, they were like, we're going to keep holding on. We're going to bring him back. Everything will be okay eventually. It didn't make sense to me because he didn't seem to care one whit about anybody interacting with him at all. I do think the whole wasteland subplot was pretty boring. But that's because I don't particularly care for poetry. There are some things that I like, some things that I don't. This is one that was really tedious and boring for me. And the fact that like he would memorize entire passages and he would quote them back to her and then she would quote from other poets. And I was just like, you guys are 17. Can, can we like tone it down? <laughs> that is Tell Me Three Things. I forgot to mention Tell Me Three Things is the title because eventually that is what their dialogue revolved around is they, every time they would chat, they would tell each other three things facts about themselves. So it's basically a get to know me sort of deal. When she asks him, why did you ever reach out? He's like, because you looked like you needed somebody. I felt more comfortable reaching out via letters than via speech because I, I didn't have to worry about anything. Like I could be who I wanted to be without the pressure of you knowing who it was so I could just rely on my anonymity in order to say what I wanted to say and and just be as free as I wanted. There we go. Good book. That's all for now. I'll see you next week. Bye.